Uh, Excellencies, uh, sisters and brothers, before we start uh, my lecture, I would like to thank you for uh, the experience of yesterday. Uh, during a communist time, I was not allowed to uh, travel outside the Soviet bloc, but after the fall of communism, I visited all continents, even Antarctica. I started uh, the day and my stay here by the pilgrimage to the tombs uh, in the mountains, and then uh, what is lecture, but also this uh, prayer and the concert. Today we will speak about synodality, but yesterday it was for me the experience of the synodal church. Because the synodality, it is to listen, to pray together, to share our experiences, and it was the practical synodality. But I am very, very thankful for this, and thank you once more for the yesterday experience of the synodal church. We are living not in an epoch of change, but in a change in epochs. Let us take the sentence of Pope Francis as an impulse for reflection. Our times are witnessing uh, climate change with an impact on the natural environment and social economic changes with political, cultural and moral implications. The speed, extent and depth of the current changes are causing a whole-scale upsetting of certainties following the long-standing disruption of traditional religious certainties. We now witness a shaking up of secular humanist certainties too, a shaking up of trust in institutions and the authority of experts. Our world is technologically and economically interconnected. There is a mixing of worlds. The process of global interconnection paradoxically brings us closer on the one hand, but on the, on the same time reveals our differences more. The process of globalization has not created a global village, but rather confronts us with the radical plurality of our world. Uh, the growing sense of uh, disorientation and anxiety about the diversity and fluidity of our world is creating a desire for simple answers to complex questions. Populism, nationalism, political extremism and religious fundamentalism are spreading. Globalization has facilitated not only the rapid exchange of goods and information, but also the rapid spread of evil, infection diseases, organized crime, terrorism and violence. The dangerous weapon of evil is fear. Fear itself is often more dangerous than what we fear. In the northern part of your beautiful country, and not only there, there is a political regime that is one big machine for producing fear. And through fear, it keeps millions of people in slavery. 
I too have lived most of my life under communist regime and I know what I'm talking about. Russia's aggression against Ukraine is not just a local conflict somewhere on the periphery of our world, but will have global, economic, political, social and moral consequences. If the West does not show sufficient solidarity with Ukraine and cannot help it to stop Russian aggression, it will mean a total collapse of confidence in the democratic world and emboldening of all dictators and aggressors worldwide. Pope Francis has long spoken of the ongoing Third World War. More than 30 years after the fall of Soviet communism, the Cold War between superpowers is back and body conflicts are taking place in many parts of our world. St. Peter's boat, the church, also toss it in many storms. But Jesus keeps saying, do not be afraid. Do, do you not have faith? The most frequent call of God in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, and Jesus' call in the Gospel is, fear not. The first task of the church is to proclaim these words and to bear witness to them by our resilience in the face of fear and despair. To overcome fear, we need faith, the living, deep, mature faith. Mature faith is much more than just a doctrine or a system of rituals and customs. Christ came to our world not to offer a doctrine, but a journey on which we continually learn to transform our humanity, our way of being human, including all our relationship to ourselves and to others, to society, to natural environment and to God. At the beginning of their history, when Christians were asked what this Christianity was, whether it was a new religion or a new philosophy, they answered, it is the way. It is the way of following the one who said, I am the way. Christians have constantly returned to this dynamic vision of faith and of the church throughout history, especially in the times of crisis. In our time of many deep crises, Pope Francis proclaims the necessity to renew the church as common way in Greek synodos, the synodal form of church. Pope Francis talks about synodality almost every day. There are synodal meetings in the local churches in every country and on every continent preparing for the synod in Rome, a meeting of bishops from around the world this year and next. Synodal meetings are at all levels in the church are about a frank exchange of faith experiences, about listening to each other, and above all, through this mutual listening, about listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church today. God also speaks to us through events in the world, through the signs of the times. Therefore, we must learn a contemplative approach to the events of our world. We must learn the art of spiritual discernment. We cannot be satisfied with the image of the world often to us by social media, newspapers and television. This is often superficial, sometimes even colored by ideological and commercial interests. The practice of meditation and contemplation allows us to understand more deeply what is happening in our world, 
to distinguish the sign of the times which are language of God from the changing spirit of the times, public opinion, advertisement, fake news, prejudices, etc. In the noise of our world, we rightly expect the church to offer the world a prophetic ministry. The role of the prophets was to interpret the current events with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, to conquer fear, to spread hope. For many centuries, religious communities have been a healing source of hope. Today, however, many of the world's religions, including our own Catholic Church, find themselves in a crisis of confidence. Why do many people become disinterest, disinterested in faith or leave the church? In the synodal process of listening to one another, we must listen to them too. According to the Pope Francis, in many places, the church has been attacked by the disease of clericalism, a mentality that, contrary to the teaching of Jesus, has made the church a rigid, bureaucratic institution of power. The abuse of power and authority in the church was particularly dangerous in the scandals of sexual, psychological, and spiritual abuse by the clergy. The synodal reform should lead to a different form of the church. The church as a network of relationships of mutual communication. We must first deepen our communication with God so that we can deepen communication within the church, between bishops, priests, and lay people to hear the voice of women and youth, and then to also deepen our communication with others, brotherly dialogue with the other Christians, with other religions and cultures. The church is supposed to be a symphony of hierarchical, democratic, and charismatic components. Each of them is irreplaceable. Theologically speaking, the role of Christians is to be witnesses of Christ's resurrection. No one was an eyewitness to Christ's resurrection. To be a witness to Christ's resurrection is to testify by one's own lifestyle that Christ is alive. alive. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Ask the angels, the angels, at the empty tomb. We should not to look for Jesus in the past, but for him living in the present, in the church, in our lives, in our world. Believing in the resurrection of Christ means understanding Christianity as an unfinished, ongoing story. This is true of the story of the gospel, it is true of the history of the church, and it is also true of our personal life story, which does not end even with physical death. We will know that Christ is alive in the face of his church and in our personal place by whether the faith of the church and our personal place is moving, growing, maturing, deepening. Christ's resurrection is unique, however, an ongoing process. Christ lives and works in the face of his church and in her many expressions, in her sacraments, liturgy, the preaching of the faith, and also in the service of Christians to all those in need. For Christ lives also behind the boundaries of the church, especially in the poor and marginalized. 
before his election to the See of Peter, Cardinal Bergoglio, the future Pope Francis, recalled the words of scripture, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. But today, he added, Jesus knocks from within. He wants to go out and we must follow him. We need to go beyond our current mental and institutional boundaries to go especially to the poor, to the marginalized, the suffering. According Pope Francis, the church must be open, welcoming church. Pope Benedict XVI expressed the idea that the church should, like the temple of Jerusalem, create a courtyard of the Gentiles, a space for pious pagans, for spiritual seekers, while sects accept only those who are fully observant and committed, the church must keep a space open for spiritual seekers, for those who, while not fully identifying with its teaching and practices, nevertheless feel some closeness to Christianity. Karl Rahner, one of the most important theologians of the 20th century, call them anonymous Christians. Jesus declared, who is not against us is with us. He warned his disciples against the zealousness of revolutionaries and inquisitors, against their attempts to play the angels of the last judgment and to separate the wet from the chaff too early. Even St. Augustine argued that many of those who think they are outside are in fact inside, and many who think they are inside are in fact outside. Church is a mystery. We know where the church is, but we do not know where she is not. In sociological terms, the church is one of the many religious institutions. From a theological perspective, it is something much more. We believe and confess that the church is a mystery, a sacrament, a sign, signum, sign of the unity of all humanity in Christ. The church is a dynamic sacrament. It is the way to that goal. Total unification of the whole human family is an eschatological goal that can only be fully realized by the end of history. Only then will the church be completely and perfectly one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Only then we will see and mirror God fully, just as he is. The task of the church is to keep the desire for this goal ever present in human hearts, and at the same time to resist the temptation to regard any form of the church, any state of society, and any state of religious, philosophical, or scientific knowledge as a final and perfect. We must always distinguish the concrete form of the, history, of the church in history from its eschatological form. That is, we must distinguish the church on the way, the church struggling, Ecclesia Militans, from the victorious church in heaven, Ecclesia Triumphans. To regard the church in the midst of history as a perfect Ecclesia Triumphans leads to triumphalism, a dangerous form of idolatry. Moreover, the Ecclesia Militans, if it does not resist the temptation of triumphalism, can become a sinful militant institution. We confess with humility 
that this has happened repeatedly in the history of Christianity. These tragic experiences lead us now to the firm conviction that the mission of the Church is to be a source of spiritual inspiration and transformation, fully respecting the freedom of conscience of every human person and rejecting any use of force, any form of manipulation. The mission is a permanent duty of the Church, but mission today cannot be understood as an effort to push people into the Church's existing mental and institutional boundaries. Rather, we need to expand these boundaries and enrich the Church with the experiences of others. The mission cannot be understood as a one-sided process, but rather as accompaniment in a spirit of dialogue, a quest for mutual understanding. We must not approach others with the pride and arrogance of owners of truth. Truth is a book that none of us has yet read to the end. We are not owners of truth, but lovers of truth, and lovers of the only one who is allowed to say, I am the truth. Jesus did not answer the Pilate's question, what is truth, with a theory, an ideology, or a definition of truth, but he testified to the truth that transcends all doctrines and ideologies. He revealed the truth that is happening, that is alive and personal. Only Jesus can say, I am the truth. And at the same time, he says, I am the way and the life. A truth that was not living and not a way would be more like an ideology, a mere theory. Orthodoxy must be combined with orthopraxy, right action. And we must not forget the third, deeper, dimension of living in truth. This is autopathy, autopathy, right? Passion, desire, inner experience, spirituality. Above all, it is through spirituality, the spiritual experience of individual believers and of the whole church that the spirit gradually introduces us to the wholeness of the truth. The Spirit is an inner teacher who develops in us the essential depth dimension of faith, spirituality, inner life in Christ. Guided by the Spirit, we can experience what St. Paul testified to. It is not longer just I who live, Christ, lives in me. The great Christian spiritual teacher, such as the medieval German mystic Master Eckhart, teach that the superficial outer man has an outer God, while the inner man has an inner God. The religion of people who live in the way the world lives conforming to the public opinion, managed by the external authorities, advertisement and ideologies is superficial. Their God is really a projection of their wishes and fears or a reflection of economic interests. Such superficial external religion was rightly criticized by the atheists like Freud or Marx. If a person revolves only around his ego, his self-centered and egoistic interests, he is immature and cannot even have a mature faith. 
only an inwardly free person in so far as he is as he frees himself from the dependence on external things such as material wealth and power can meet the true god the naked god freed from our human infantile fantasies transcending one's selfishness towards other means a christian experience of transcendence openness to other people is the opening a space in which god in christ can live and act in our lives this applies to our private lives as well as the life of the church if the church succumbs to self-centeredness the collective narcissism narcissism cares only for itself and succumbs to fear it closes the door of uh, to the living christ such self-contained forms of the church lose credibility and vitality they die the purpose of the current synodal reform of the church is not only the updating of the institutional structures of the church but all these reforms must be preceded and accompanied by the renewal of the life of faith it is especially the care of of its deep dimension spirituality i repeat the life of faith is participation in the ever going event of the of the resurrection living christianity is in movement it is happening it is becoming it is still unfinished it is still on the way uh, to its eschatological consummation if our faith is alive uh, it will mature during human life and throughout history at the last supper jesus promises his disciples the spirit helper who will gradually lead them into the fullness of the truth on various occasions he says you cannot understand this now you will understand it later we must be patient the truth is revealed gradually throughout the life of individual believers and throughout the history of the church god's presence is dynamic if jesus gave us children as an example he does not mean to say Uh, that we should remain children that our religion should be infantile we should resemble children in our openness non hypocrisy spontaneity and last but not least the ability to wonder learn and grow it is natural that during the adolescence there is a crisis of childhood faith and it is impossible to return to it just as one cannot put on child's shoes it is necessary to offer young people a mature face a face capable of integrating critical thinking and doubt face is the courage to enter the cloud of mystery the certainty of face is not a mathematical certainty it is not evidence that we arrive at by solving problems it is more the courage to trust honest doubts can be used for sister to faith they can support each other along the way belief without any doubt and open questions can lead to fundamentalism fanatism and bigotry a doubter without the ability to doubt his doubts without the change without the courage to trust can end up in bitter and cynical pragmatism the path of living faith also includes crises passages through the dark valley of the experience of god's absence god's silence 
in addition to the personal dark nights that many mystics write about, where there are also the collective dark nights. In my book, Patience with God, I write about mature and immature responses to the times of God's silence in personal lives and in the history of the church and the world. Uh, an immature, impatient response to God's silence is atheism, which interprets this experience as a non-existence of God or the death of God. Fundamentalists or religious enthusiasts react similarly superficially, shooting over the quiet music of God's silence by repeating an old theory or merely an emotional hallelujah, hallelujah. Only mature faith combined with hope and love can withstand the test of patience. Patience is essential to through love, through hope, and through faith. In my latest book, and now also published in Korean, Afternoon of Christianity, I write about the maturation of faith in history of Christianity, the history of faith and the history of the church is not a simple one-way progress. Light and darkness, holiness and sin intermingle in them. I was inspired to use the word afternoon by the metaphor chosen by Carl Gustav Jung, the founder of analytical psychology, to describe the dynamics of individual human life. The morning of life is used and in an early adulthood when people develop the basic features of their personality and take their place in society. Then comes the noonday crisis, the midlife crisis. It is time of fatigue, sleepiness, a loss of energy or burnout syndrome. A crisis can affect our health, careers, partnership, our faith, and spiritual life. The afternoon of life, mature and old age, is an opportunity to complete the lifelong process of maturing, a time to develop our inner spiritual life. However, it is also possible to miss this opportunity to continue only with the morning activities, uh, it seems career and wealth building. There can also be bad aging. One becomes rigid, anxious, and melancholic. I am to apply this metaphor to the history of Christianity. Pre-modern epoch is morning, a time in which the church built up its institutional and doctrinal structures. Then came the noonday crisis, the shaking of these structures in modernity, from reformation to the enlightenment, from the rise of the atheism to religious indifference, but secularization, the change in the social cultural climate did not bring an end, but a transformation of Christianity. Today, Christianity stands on the threshold of the afternoon of his history. We are at a crossroads. There is an opportunity to go deeper towards a more mature form of Christianity. Many new ways of being a Christian are opening up. It is time to revive and deepen the dynamic character of Christianity. A truly evangelization, worthy of the name, has a difficult task today to seek the living, resurrected, transformed, universal Christ, whose greatness is often hidden by the limitations of our vision, our two narrow perspectives, 
and intellectual categories. Many of our concepts, ideas and expectations, many forms of our faith, many forms of church and theology must die. They were too small. Our faith must surmount the walls built by our fears and our lack of courage to venture out like Abraham along unknown paths into an unknown future. We live in a challenging time of many changes and crises. However, every crisis is both a chance and opportunity. It is through crisis that our faith becomes mature and only with a mature faith can we overcome difficulties of our time. Thank you. Thank you. So it's connected with, the, uh, with something which is very important in the Jesuit spirituality and the discernment of, of the spirits. It was the experience of the Ignatius of Loyola and, uh, and it is part of the Jesuit spirituality uh, to, um, to reflect what is happening in, your, in the sanctuary of your heart and uh, every day to stop and to rethink uh, your experiences, your emotions, your, your, your thoughts, to, to reflect it and to realize what these events, events from outside, but also your inner um, ideas and uh, voices in you what, uh, what was the effect of this? Was it the inner freedom, what is uh, joy or anxiety, anger? And the Ignatius said if these uh, ideas or events uh, are, it's, uh, it's inspired the joy in you, uh, so it is from God. It, if uh, the effect is the anger, uh, confusion, uh, melancholy, and so on, it is not from God. So uh, perhaps this discernment of, uh, of the spirits, I hope it was the answer. <laughs> So it's connected with, the, uh, with something which is very important in the Jesuit spirituality and the discernment of, of the spirits. It was the experience of the Ignatius of Loyola and, uh, and it's part of the Jesuit spirituality uh, to, uh, to reflect what is happening in, your, in the sanctuary of your heart and uh, uh, every day to stop and to rethink uh, your experiences, your emotions, your, your, your thoughts, to, to reflect it and to realize what these events, events from outside, but also your inner um, ideas and uh, voices in you, what what was the effect of this? Was it the inner freedom, what is uh, joy or anxiety, anger? And the Ignatius said if these uh, ideas or events uh, it's, uh, it's inspired the joy in you, uh, so it is from God. It, if uh, the effect is the anger, 
confusion, uh, melancholy, and so on. It is not from God. So uh, perhaps this discernment of uh, of the spirits. I hope it was the answer. <laughs>